Leeds, 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 what is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? I don't think I have a strong memory of any kind of key fireman or pilot or soldier, uh, which are sort of classics that spring to mind for, for stereotypical kind of lifelong ambition but I think I think as a kid I I was passionate about football and loved playing football um so I think football is probably one when I was the, a, a young young kid that I was probably most excited about dreaming about um and then I think beyond that I probably dreamt of being a sort of David Attenborough type person whether it's whether it's on screen and actually presenting or whether it's actually maybe behind the camera or in those kind of production teams or actually maybe the sort of scientists and conservationists behind those kind of programs so i think yeah football and then conservation were probably the the things that that came to me throughout my throughout my childhood you're listening to series three episode two and to my guest simon moore this is a zoom interview recorded on the 12th of january 2022 Hey up. So it appears, feels that I have to mention the war. I don't want to. It's part of the reason I didn't have an introduction last week and why I missed out publishing an episode the week before that. I was too angry, sad and bored of my species to even deal with it. So yeah, unsurprisingly, I am against war and I'm against this war too, but that doesn't stop war happening. Only talking, discussion and diplomacy end war as far as I'm concerned. And that's what the men with power should focus on, peace. That's what I focus on, don't you? I don't want to wage war, promote war, or do anything for war or for its benefits. I'm more of a whatever you do, do it for peace kind of guy. So I condemn the war and I personally would call for peace. That is my full and complete statement on it, don't at me. All a bit much, isn't it? Well, don't worry, it's all bound to get much worse and never get any better ever again because that time has passed now again. So let's forget about all those things and talk climate change. At least that has nothing to do with resources, fuels, extraction, power or any of those sorts of things. I have changed my war board to a peace board. That was a futile, impotent gesture that I did. I have also decided that when I can be asked getting around to it or an actual need arises for it to exist that my environmental policy will also include some form of commitment to peace. But you know the great thing about working somewhere with no staff, no customers, no pay and that's in near total obscurity? There's no rules. Not only does everything you do not matter but also nobody cares about it. Unlike this podcast... There is some meaning in my life after all. Working Hours does have some actual listeners, it seems. So, hello again. How are you? How are you coping? You know what I'm going to do for you. Because you're here. I have something for you. Do you want it now? What is it? Okay, I'll tell you. It's an episode of Working Hours with Simon Moore as the guest. You might know Simon from his own show, Climatic. If not, why not go listen to his show after you've heard this episode? Simon Moore is a climate justice activist and science communicator in Leeds. He dedicates his work and a fair bit of his spare time to tackling the climate crisis and the social justice issues that are being exacerbated by it. Simon works half of the week for the University of Leeds as a communications and engagement officer, helping to support the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission, amongst other projects. And the other half of the week, he is admin and logistics lead, for the community project Climate Action Leads. Simon is a podcaster producing episodes around climate activism for his show Climactic, which you should check out, and he also likes playing football, going to gigs, COVID permitting, and as of recently, playing chess. It was great to chat to Simon, and I'm really interested in hearing from anyone in Leeds or from Leeds in whatever industry, sector or role you are in. Come on the show, be the guest. Represent yourself, your role, your experience, your pay grade. What is your experience? Don't let someone else tell you. Come and tell me yourself. How do you feel about work? 
How much have you ever even thought about where you spend most of your life? What do you do, Leeds? Well, if you don't want to tell me about it because your job's too shameful and or you have to sign an NDA because your job is too shameful, but you want to hear from other loiners with less shameful occupations about their work, then please help this podcast in whatever way you actually can. Remember, you're not just helping me and this podcast, you're helping Leeds too. Please like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. This is a pretty unique show, Leeds. I haven't seen anyone else having this conversation in this way yet. I'm sure there are others. Actually, I doubt there are. This is hard. Most people don't want to talk and no one is focusing on work in the same way as me. If the unions were more savvy, they'd be sponsoring this show. If a small recruitment agency was forward thinking, they'd want to be sponsoring this show. The savvy people will turn up in time. Meanwhile, it's you and me, bub. And I'm doing most of the work and carrying all of the costs. Brothers and sisters, please give us a quid. If you want to support Working Hours, please leave a review or rating for this show. If you can afford £12 a year, you can sign up to the Patreon to pay for this show. It's a pound a month because even though I really need the cash, it's more important for me that anyone can be contributing, should they want to be. Um, And that's as low as the amount goes. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod right now and sign up to help me in getting 1000 loiners recorded for working hours. There will be bonus material in the future, but not if no one signs up. The more you do, the more I do. Please rate and review working hours and I'll see you next time, our kid. So what is it that you're doing now then? I'm a kind of science communicator and do a bit of kind of project management um, in, in two two roles that I do. I sort of split my week. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, halfway through my second job as it, as it is on the Thursday evening. Uh, so yeah, I kind of split my week, uh, uh, Wednesday lunchtime, I swap between kind of climate communication Mm -hmm. in a role that I do at the university of Leeds, Mm -hmm. uh, and more of a kind of admin logistics kind of project management type role that I do, uh, with a community project called climate action Leeds. Uh, so yeah, broad, broadly speaking, I am helping to kind of promote climate research, climate sort of collaboration between lots of different organizations and people. It's very much based around Leeds. So I work for Leeds Climate Commission, uh, Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission and Climate Action Leeds. So it's it's all very much about, you know, focusing on the people and the place and trying to get beyond, um, just doing science and, and getting, doing research and and getting evidence. It's much more about driving action on the ground and trying to make, make this stuff accessible to lots of people, because at the end of the day, it's going to affect and already is affecting everyone and we need everyone to be part of the solution. So yeah, I see part of my job and and certainly the the roles I'm doing right now is, is helping to push towards those aims so how did you come into that like was you how come it was two jobs was it just one was part-time and you had to make up the hours or did you want to do a mix of things like well how did that come about it came about from i I guess yeah so I, i i kind of i guess i jumped i jumped ship i jumped ship from a permanent and full time job that that I guess, you know, it was, it was comfortable and very enjoyable and, and fun. And that was around the, well, yeah, during, during the last couple of years, during the pandemic, in fact. Um, so that was as a kind of science communicator role in the press office at the university of Leeds. Um, and I was doing that for a couple of years. So I had the privilege of getting to work with different academics every week, um, and essentially I'd, I'd swoop in at the end of, you know, years and years of research where someone's got some really exciting results that they want to tell the public about and, and get journalists interested in, uh, we'd swoop in and help to kind of craft the messaging and do that liaison with, with journalists and, and help to get that, that media coverage. Um, and, but I've, I kind of jump jump ship essentially the impending climate and ecological emergency as like weighs more and more heavily on my mind. And and I think particularly through groups like Extinction Rebellion um, and the kind of youth climate strikes, they 
they convinced me, they sort of pushed me over the edge really from uh, sort of concern, but not doing much sort of actively beyond, you know, y- your own sort of carbon footprint. Um, and, and they pushed me towards A, being becoming part of activism, climate activism, and, and B, then realizing I enjoy the job I do in the press office and, and doing science communication, but it was mainly around sort of health, uh, occasionally sort of like, you know, life sciences, biology, but I kind of realized I, I need to throw everything in, into this and, and that if possible, that I want that to include uh, my working hours. What do you enjoy about the role? Um, let's, let's start there. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about jumping around, but I think I'll just go through the normal, the normal route. So. What do you enjoy about the roles? Um, start with either one. So what I enjoy, uh, my university role, what I probably enjoy most about it, I guess is it's kind of like the potential uh, that what's exciting about the climate commissions I work for is that they, as I, as I said, that they're, they're really going beyond just kind of doing research and gathering evidence and much more about creating meaningful change and, and transforming society. Um, so what's exciting about them is all the different organizations uh, that, that our commissioners are sort of drawn from. Mm. Um, and also kind of the political buy-in that, that we managed to get for these, um, for these commissions. They're, they're essentially independent advisory groups, mm-hmm. uh, but they have buy-in from, in, in the case of Leeds Climate Commission, lead city council mm. and they kind of act as ad- advisors to them and in the case of the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission they have the buy-in and support of uh, the Yorkshire and Humber Leaders Board which is all I've forgotten the number it might be 20 city councils across across that region so right. it, I guess it's slightly abstract from the kind of day-to-day of what I do in in in, in my in my time do, during work but what I enjoy about it is that I guess the the kind of reach and the impact that it, it feels like we're we're making that um I guess it goes back to why I jumped ship and, and wanted yeah. to work in, in climate. What I enjoy about it is seeing that we're doing things that are, are making change happen. I don't want to go into changing things straight away. So let's let's kind of go in, in a bit more depth into the climate commissions then. So on a day-to-day basis, what are the things that you're kind of seeing or what are the things that you've been really proud to be part of? Yeah. So with, with the climate commissions, um, I think, yeah, one of the, the, the strengths of it really is bringing together like-minded people, but from very different kind of sectors and and industries. Mm. So yeah, so we, 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 we're really helping to bring, you know, people from the agricultural sector together with people from kind of the energy sector or the housing sector. Um, and we, we've specifically managed to recruit, you know, people that are quite dedicated to, to this, uh, to this move to, to tackling climate change. But I think without the commission, they wouldn't find it as easy to find each other. Um, and also it's really helping to by working together, they can help to, you know, basically move things along faster mm. uh, and start to come up with really kind of ambitious ideas and uh, plans and a kind of momentum for, for change in, in the city or, and in the region. So, I, I mean, is it all working groups and plans for the future or have you managed to get sort of practical things realised already? Good question. So, I my experience with the... Working for for Leeds and the Auction Humber Climate Commission is all still fairly new. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, they're both quite new organisations, aren't they? The the Yorkshire and Humber one has been going since March, so I've and I was involved from the start and for for almost all of that time since. So so yes, it that, it it would be it's it's pretty fair to say that we it, it's I'd say it's reasonably difficult to to pinpoint you know, super strong, direct kind of, um, consequences so far for, for that commission. We're, we're at the stage of, uh, having 
work very hard, put lots, got lots of people together, including kind of members of the public uh, to, to produce uh, a climate action plan for, for Yorkshire and Humber. And that's got kind of 50 big, big action points for, for the region to take up. And now we're starting to see individual councils, sometimes councils working together, starting to go, okay, well, that point there, we're actually quite strong on. Yeah. Rather than doing this on our own, we've let's connect with other councils in the region and say, you know, we want to be the leaders in this space, but you know, we, let's do this together. Yeah. Um, and the obvious examples are around, you know, things like things like flooding, for example, where the, the droplets of rain and the water doesn't care which kind of council or which mm. local authority they're flowing through. Uh, and it's quite obviously, you know, these lines we've drawn in, in, in the sand are pretty arbitrary. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a different flooding plan from one council to the next yeah. when ultimately that water is going to flow from, from your neighbors through to you if, if you're downhill. So, so it's things like that where, and, and also it's, you know, it's, it's the strength of, um, more, ex, you know, more experience. It's, it's, there's no point kind of re redesigning things across, across councils that face yeah. similar, similar challenges and funding issues and all sorts. Yeah. Like duplicating all that work and everyone doing the same thing or doing different things and contradictory things. And... Yeah, absolutely. Let's go into the other questions then. So we'll start off with, um, the pandemic. You said that was part of the thing that pushed you into this new role. Talk us through kind of lockdown and, and how COVID sort of affecting your work currently, if it is. So the pandemic, I guess, was uh, a challenge for everyone. The challenge for me was um, swapping roles at the university. Uh, and it was day two of my new role that, that we started working from home. So mm. I had I had a, a tour of the office and, and that was about it in terms of you know, meet, meeting a few colleagues and then from, from then on working from home. And, and that was actually a secondment. And that was my first kind of step into uh, a climate communications role. Mm -hmm. um, and that was with the Priestley International Center for Climate at the university. So, yeah, so there's, there's the challenge there, which now I think many people have experienced, which is how do how do I work with new people that I barely know? Uh, I don't know how tall they are. I don't know, you know, I don't know their mannerisms and, and I don't know them well as, as, as people and, yeah. and not just as workers. So that's, that's, that's a challenge, but yeah, as I say, I, I they were people that I, I'd met a few times. So I had at least uh, that, that little bit to go on. And actually the, the work that I was set out, setting out to do changed quite drastically as well because I, I was brought in on a secondment to help the university kind of publicize its climate plan which was then put on hold because there's a global pandemic and there's suddenly you know a lot of other high priorities of 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 things that need dealing with so so that was a yeah an interesting time where for so for most of that year essentially not only was it a, a change in working from home throughout, but also uh, an almost total change in, okay, well, well, I'm now going to be doing more kind of general support for other colleagues into, yeah. instead of uh, this quite big project that I'd been hoping and, and excited to work on. But, but as I say, but it was very enjoyable and it got my kind of dipping my toes into to a move from more general science communication to, to climate. So towards, towards the end of that, I was offered another secondment, which I was excited by, and it was to help to set up the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. Mm. Again, it was sort of staying within the university, but as anyone who's done a secondment will know, you know, if, if you, you get a taste of something that you want to move towards and then suddenly if it, if there's no kind of continuation of that at the end, you've got that sort of kind of weird disappointment feeling of going back to what you were doing before. Yeah. Um, 
and so I and so I, that that kind of happened to me. But I, as I say, I was offered another secondment, um, which I was, I think I was very fortunate that my manager said yes, you can, you can go and do that almost instantly after returning to the team. So thank you again, Gareth. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then and then and then I've been fortunate that. And this comes on to why I'm now working two jobs that that was a secondment for a s- six months full time to help set up the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the end of that point, they they had enough funding to continue that role uh, for half of the week, but not for a full week. Yeah. Um, so it was then kind of fortunate timing, really, that I saw this project, which I'd kind of had an eye on and uh knew about and had been involved with um in its sort of establishment and and uh very early stages and that I saw kind of climate action needs and I saw this this role that I thought that that normally I would never click on a job advert that says admin and logistics lead. Yeah. Um <laughs> I you know uh, as I say this is probably the f- yeah the first job advert I've ever clicked on with that job title. I see myself as a kind of you know, a, a science communicator and a comms person and mm. engagement and and that kind of thing. Um, but I knew what the project was about, mm. and it it's local. It's more kind of community level. It's outside the university. It, it also, as I say, it kind of fit fit quite neatly. Mm. Uh, so I thought I'll I'll open it and see you know see what that entails. Mm. um as a as a job advert and i guess yeah, what i kind of found was that looking through the job advert i kind of thought there's quite a f- quite a few things in here that are the sort of mund- you know quite mundane tasks that mm. any organization needs and w- with you know w- whatever shape or size organization that is um and i th- i looked through it and i thought i do quite a, lo- a lot of this stuff in my spare time mm. for various different sort of climate activist groups that I'm part of. Mm. Uh, and I, and so I kind of thought if this was any organize, you know, any old organization doing any old business, I wouldn't want to do this job. Yeah. Um, but given how sort of strongly I'm behind the aims of this organization, I would happily do the fairly boring bits of, of, of this organization's work because mm. the the goals of it are so exciting. Mm. Um, and I also uh, w- would give a shout out to colleagues like Margot Hansen that I work with who fulfills this kind of role at the university. I kind of, again, sort of suddenly had this sort of, this moment of realization that, I, you know, that that, that kind of role can, can play a lot of, that kind of role can drive a lot of sort of action and positivity in, in yeah. these projects. And it might sound like dull and boring and mundane work, but it's integral, it, you know, the whole thing yeah. falls down without it. It's foundational to the success of a project or an organization. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of attitude for those kind of roles as well. I, I think the downside with a lot of the, climate and you know uh, ecological emergency stuff is that it's not profitable you know yeah. to sort of plant trees or you know like regenerate a river or um so it's it's finding ways to make that pay like even for yourself because you're going to have to you know if you commit into a climate action you're going to have to put time into that put resources into it yeah and um if you want to put more time and resources into it Ideally, you want to be getting paid for doing that. Right, then let's go into the difficulties a bit then. So what are the, what are the, so rather than kind of what are the negatives, I'd like to go in with what are the three things that you'd like to change about the role? So if you could change any three things about either of the roles today, what would they be? Or both of the roles, let's do both roles. Interesting. Okay, so what would I change about my role climate action leads? Um... I guess this would apply to both jobs and comes back to the question about the pandemic. I think it's kind it's kind of um beyond imagination now, but it would be amazing to be surrounded by my colleagues mm. 
Uh, I'm currently, you know, in the second bedroom um, and haven't sort of sat down and worked alongside a colleague mm. for for close to two years. Um, so I think I'd certainly change that about both roles that mm. I look forward to doing that. Um, and we've kind of realized we were maybe a bit slow to trying to do that last year. Mm. Um, with, with climate action leads where we we currently don't because we're the, the the team i'm part of is is in itself a new organization so we don't have a an office space that we were just waiting to go back to when restrictions lifted yeah so we took the more cautious approach of okay well let's not dive into finding an office immediately uh, and we're now kind of regretting that a bit because it, we're, we're now working you know we're now back to um being forced to work from home. So, so I yeah. think that that's something that we'll be looking to do differently over the coming sort of months, I think. Mm. Another thing I'd change, I mean, f from what we were just talking about, I wonder whether if we wanted to attract someone else to, to help me in this role, I wonder if we need to like change the job title. Mm. Um, because as, as I've said, I don't think it's an attractive one for someone to, uh, to click on. Um, I've started referring to the, my other colleague, Margo, as like sort of admin maestro or, you know, so just something that's a bit more appealing um, and I guess almost like fl flattering. Um, yeah, so may maybe we'll, we'll rethink the job title a little bit. Something more like a climate imagineer or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think it's, it's, it's important. I mean, it makes, I think it probably makes quite a big difference in, in recruitment. Um, but yes, you've also got to weigh that up against people need to have an idea of what this person's supposed yeah. to be doing. Yeah. Uh, otherwise it's, it's pie in the sky. Um, what else would I change about it? Um, uh, this kind of conflicts with having another job, but it, it would make the, one of the challenges we have in climate action leads is that a lot of people are part-time if not if not everyone and the amount of hours we have to dedicate to it means uh, versus all of our ambition for how fast it, all of our ambition and like fear about how fast we need to work mm. uh, creates this conflict of uh kind of constantly underachieving against what we would all like to be doing yeah um so yeah, I think, and I think the the way, the only way we'll be able to address that is through what we're hoping to do, which is raise more money so that we we now have a great kind of skeleton in place of, of the program and the project. But actually, if we, if we were able to get the same amount of money again, we could double everyone's time on the project and, yeah. you know, double the speed and urgency with which we could do things. So. But yeah, that, as I say, that that also conflicts with my other role because uh, there's only so many hours in in the week. Mm. Um, at the university, what would I change in that role? Um, again, I think it, what the the strength of climate commissions is bringing together lots of different people, mm. and because we launched in March 2021, we haven't been able to. We brought those people together once yeah in person and that was an event we were kind of co-running it was a, a yorkshire climate summit um so when i say we brought everyone together it was maybe yeah m maybe maybe half at the most more like mm -hmm. a, a third a third of of the people that we're wanting to so so yeah that again that's that's kind of big big challenge there uh, and and i guess it's a challenge we've given ourselves because Yorkshire and the Humber is quite a large area geographically <laughs> and it's a climate commission. So, you know, we're not going to be flying people from one side of the county to, to the other to, mm. to come and to come and meet. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge going forward. Um, what else will I change in the role? Are you trying to be diplomatic or you're actually just trying to wear? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good. Uh, good question. I think. I think. I think. What I've just realised is I'm pretty content. Um, I think a, most of the things I would change are, think, are things around the pandemic, or you know, 
it's working from home mm. is is a privilege especially in a pandemic mm. um and i'm pretty hopeful that we'll get to do a mix at some point one day uh we'll get to do a mixture of you know uh, of some days at home and some days in an office so th there's been benefits to that as well but yeah i think overall having just reflected i think uh, i i'm i'm pretty content with most of 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 that role at the university um that i guess again the same caveat would apply that i and we kind of constantly find ourselves in this battle again maybe it's because we're working in climate but i think i found it before as well that our ambitions are again just far higher than our sort of resources mm. can can actually allow uh, and so you know t to keep sane and sort of fulfilled in what you're doing you you need to you need to balance out your kind of your expectations of what you're able to do mm. um yeah i i'm guessing there's a lot of long-term goal setting for it and there's a lot of big target goal setting for it and then it's a matter of incrementally working towards those yeah so that's in terms of, of changing stuff so I'll try and do a segue. So in terms of change, <laughs> how has Brexit affected work? And like, can you, I mean, can you even tell this seems to be a, a thing that comes up of like, it's hard to disentangle from the pandemic? Uh, Brexit at the, so yeah, Brexit for me working at the university has, I would say definitely had created quite a big impact. Mm hmm almost all negatively. I'm not sure I can think of any positives to it. I guess in general, you know, uh, people that, that have come across the university and as leads in, in some way will, will hopefully get the idea as with many other universities that, you know, we're, we're very much an international kind of outward looking, inclusive kind of institution, uh, both in terms of the the people that we welcome to teach that we welcome to study but also the research that we do and and the people that make up the university community so i would say there's there's definitely definitely a feeling working there in, in the communications team that mm. brexit goes against the things we stand for mm. um and it's going to make attracting or certainly it's potentially going to make attracting students to come and study in in the uk a more difficult prospect mm. i think we found that some of that fear wasn't fully realized but 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 certainly some of it was um so that was kind of yeah that's kind of in terms of i guess you know attracting students and even attracting researchers to come and and work for us um, the, the other major impact I think is around, is around funding and I couldn't tell you the, the exact figure, but it was probably around the sort of maybe as high as 25% of research funding that the university gets every year came directly from European Union, uh, funding. So, so again, that, that was a major area where we had to diverse, diversify and, you know, figure out alternative, um, funding arrangements. And in many cases that, you know, that's not just some sort of nebulous impact, like on, you know, profit or on the bottom line or anything like that. It, it's the, the way that projects and research works at a university means that if a five-year project is suddenly going to end earlier, that means people's contracts are going to run out earlier. Um, or if a project that, you know, we've been doing for 20 years is, is an, and on a recurring basis, it's, it's suddenly not going to exist anymore. And, and often what you get is that there are some, some research teams and some departments who they, they tend to get funding from the same places quite regularly. So there'll be some departments that aren't very effective because they get funding from the UK government or for, through charities or through kind of international funds or wh whatever it might be. But then there'll be certain groups that almost they're all the money that they rely on uh, and ever have relied on is EU funding. 
Um, so it, yeah, so it ha has a quite a big impact for some and, and, and not so big for others, but overall, yeah, it's obviously just made, made life more difficult for, for the kind of core work that we want to do of, of teaching and, and research. Mm. Okay. So we'll go on to the happier one then. <laughs> so, um, if you had a universal basic income, would you still be doing both these roles? Would you be doing something else? What would you do? Good question. I guess you, you kind of don't want your employer to hear this answer because if you say yes, then they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, you don't need that pay rise or <laughs> you don't need that. i surprised how many people do say yes. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I would say probably yes in both cases. I guess the, the sort of trade off there becomes like, okay. I've got a universal basic income, so I'm kind of content. I can do sort of the basics of, of life, um, which is great and, and, and brilliant. But I guess the, the question then is, okay, well, do I want, do I want more than that? And if so, how much more than that? Mm. Um, but, but no, for, for me, I. Uh, the, the job I do for climate action leads, as I say, I, I, in fact, the two jobs I do now, I jumped ship from a permanent role to two part-time and, um, fixed term contracts. So I think my dad would say, and, and did say, you know, that's not a good idea, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but I did, you know, I did that because I wanted to do those roles. Yeah. Um, and I would, yeah. And, and I would still still be doing them if it was a case of universal basic income for everyone and we'll kind of divide the jobs between us mm. yeah um i surprisingly i haven't had anyone say that they would go study yet which i thought you know because that like the, the sort of top answers when i've asked people outside of the podcast is kind of it's either go away to so travel yeah or go back to uni go back to school seem to be the top two answer <laughs> but it, but in this, because it's a work context and we're thinking work-wise, most people are like, would I do my job? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, right then. So, I, I mean, we've, we've touched around climate change. I should probably keep my face facing the mic. Um, <laughs> we, we, we sort of talked around climate change. So, uh, I mean, my question is normally how does climate change affect your work or how is it affecting your work? Um, but in this instance, climate change is your work. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, do you want to do you want to say anything specific around climate change, or do you want to talk about any projects that are upcoming that people can get involved in, or like um, basically the floor the floor to you to say what you want about it? <laughs> sure. Well, I think in the spirit of the the usual question, um, my you know my job is a is affected by uh, my my work life has been affected by climate change in that if we weren't in this drastic situation, I would be, look, I'd be in a different, a somewhat different career and different career mm. path. Um, it is, it's, it's meant that I felt like this is, that there's no alternative to, to fight in this, uh, this incredible fight. Um, so yeah, I think in, and, and as I've said that, that has a knock on impact of, uh, then a challenging kind of work life and satisfaction, because I can almost tell you now for a fact that we're probably not going to succeed in, in, in either of my roles. We're not going to succeed in, in, in doing the things that we need to do as, as fast as, as we need to. And so, you know, we're kind of fighting and losing fight. It's just how. How much are we going to lose by? Uh, which is, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a sad thing to admit and have to have to ponder. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of things to get involved with, I think with with climate action leads, we're very much a collaborative and kind of public facing type project and, and program. Um, so one of my 
responsibilities is to help organize some big public events and um, that we're that we're running twice a year every six months or so for the five years that we are uh, operating we're already um just over a year in so we had a big kind of launch events um sort of october last year uh, but the, these are very much we're, we're kind of imagining that these are going to evolve um and and kind of look like different things each time so it might be that sometimes they're they are more kind of conferences and discussions and things like that. But other times uh, they might be more like a festival kind of vibe and trying to get loads of different people in and, and get, you know, more of a kind of creative response to, to climate change and how we can make our city greener and more beautiful and more friendly and healthy for everyone. Um, so that's, they're the kind of key things to look out for uh, if you're anywhere near Leeds and interested in, in getting involved in, in future. So, uh, the, the, around the sort of 28th of April is, is a Thursday, but it'll be kind of that week that we're doing our next big set of public events, probably a week, week long activity. And then it'll be October again, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, but on top of that, one of the key ways that we're kind of operating as a program is to set up kind of climate hubs, we're calling them. So. There's going to be a central one that we're just working on at the moment, a sort of city hub in the center of Leeds. And we're actually on the lookout for venues for this. So we were imagining kind of, you know, disused shop or department store or council building. Uh, if any listeners have got ideas for this, we're, we're looking to set up a kind of climate emergency center where people can come together and brainstorm ideas, work on new projects, but again, also bring in that kind of creativity and training and skill sharing and and and, and all sorts really. And um, so that's kind of central city hub that that we're looking to set up over the next few months. And um, on top of that, we're we're setting up community hubs around Leeds um, in eight, eight different places. So we've already got Beeston, Garforth, Otley, um, Seacroft are kind of the first ones that, that were starting to kick off. And, and mm. in those areas, we're helping to support local groups to work on the, the kind of issues that they're most, they're most interested in. There's plenty more in the pipeline. We've got, uh, funding for kind of small projects. So if people have got ideas for those, uh, we'll be looking for applications in the next couple of months. Uh, and on top of that, maybe, maybe it's a bit more, uh, bit more abstract but quite excited by the work we're doing around kind of a donor economics uh plan for lead mm. um so how can we not just think about okay we need to avoid mass carbon emissions um, but also thinking about you know other pollutants and, and avoiding uh kind of other kind of breaking other ecological limits that that yeah, are non-negotiable the, the the physical limits that that in some cases we are breaking and and damaging the the planet and the environment that that supports us on on this planet. But that's the kind of environmental side of of the donut. But the the inside of the donut is around a kind of social foundation, making sure that every person in Leeds has their basic needs met of um, food, shelter. Uh, income, um, able to participate in democracy, uh, and and so there's there's a lot of work going on there between people in climate action leads, the council, the university, uh, starting to think about how how do we bring this in in into practice and essentially shift from a model that's focusing on kind of growth and profit as the sole benchmark that. Mm we judge ourselves on as a society, uh, and trying to move more towards, you know, we need to support people and we need to avoid destroying our environment and, and they should be our focuses and, and, um, and, and yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, so I want to, I've normally got a question about social media, so, uh, I'm going to drop that in here. So do you do, firstly, do you have to do social media for work? I mean, you kind of do, um, yeah. And like, do you do, you know, do you create all your content yourself? Uh, how much, how much work does it take as well? How much of your time does it take up? 
yeah, I've kind of, I've kind of always done social media at work. Um, I did now I can it's kind of a, maybe a slight relief that I do it half the week and then not the other half of the week because the first half of the week, you know, with a colleague, we look after sort of four different accounts just on Twitter, for example. Mm. Um, so yes, it's quite a, yes, it is quite a bit of work and it's, it's a reasonable part of the work that I do. Um, it's certainly not kind of a sole focus, but it's, it's, it's part of our kind of routine really of, um, helping to, to get the word out there, partly because we work with academics and it's quite a big part of the kind of academic culture and, and, and working working experience i think uh but yeah climate action leads is also also on social media but um i've got kind of colleagues that that look after that I'm, i might dabble and, and help them out in in future but uh i think i'm probably pleased not to have it as a kind of sole responsibility <laughs> i mean it, that's the kind of double-edged sword as well isn't it because you kind of need to do it and get the communication out there but it's also like i'm just creating this useless data uh, on a constant basis and like you know storage and electricity and all of that and it's like and all the people that are streaming all the time and it's like should we be encouraging this so it's mm. but then you've got a part of it's about awareness so it's like you know when yeah. environmentalists fly and stuff and it's like well i shouldn't fly but in this instance i kind of need to fly so doing those calculations <laughs> yeah yeah there's some there's sometimes some slightly tricky trade-offs um and i think we tend to i think i think it's something as a as a whole university community not not just myself and colleagues that that we need to to look at is you know if we're seriously gonna hit our target of being net zero by 2030 as a university we need to look long and hard at our policy on flying to conferences for example and in that sense, the pandemic has helped to show that that is not necessary. Yes, you can probably get more out of, uh, you know, a three-day conference in, in, person. In, yeah. in person, but you could present at five different conferences if you didn't fly to that one. So yeah. the, the, there were there were definite trade-offs, but I think, yeah, it's partly from a, I guess it's partly a, a, sort of public perception point of view that, you know, we have a lot of climate scientists as well. And I think we're, we're in this kind of gray zone where we're starting this, basically the new kind of moral societal norms are starting to emerge and people like people working in climate change or just anyone at somewhere like a university that says we're committed to not contributing massively to climate change, yeah. you know, need to be taking the lead and saying, okay, this is what is a new norm that we're, yeah. we're adopting. Yeah. In terms of, I just want to go into the, um, the climate committees again. So in terms of your stakeholders, I mean, it, it's very open and it's kind of open to anyone to kind of come in, but is it mainly being, is it mainly sort of private and public sector or is it, you know, sort of civil society and stuff? It is a, it's a real mixture. So we kind of, we kind of pride ourselves on, on being a mixture of public, private and third sector. Um, so we have kind of community groups, um, religious groups, kind of a real, real diversity of, of voices and, and, and yeah, and, and sectors. I think um, we're, we're confident that you need that diversity of institutions to, to be coming together. And, but as I say, it's, it's important that we we're brought together by the location that we all happen to find ourselves yeah. kind of working and living in and we yeah, are kind of brought together by that location and a sort of shared understanding and commitment to tackling, uh, climate change. Does it make sense then? Like, cause it seems to me some of the work that you're doing you know, you're kind of working in the the university, which is a bit, you know, sort of higher level. And then the, the climate action plans are kind of, you're trying to do, it seems a little bit like you're trying to do a bit of, you know, top down and bottom up 
Would you say that's fair? Yes. Yes. I think that, <laughs> that, that's very fair. And again, it's, it's part of the reason that I'm doing these two that, you know, that I've volunteered to, to be doing this double act. Doing both. Yeah. I'm doing that. And in fact, uh, two days ago, I was in a meeting between Leeds Climate Commission and Climate Action Leeds. And I, I kind of said, because I, I'm still quite new, I've only been doing this double act for four or five months, really. And there's this mutual understanding and willingness between the two things I work for to there's this, this willingness to work together and sort of, uh, there's a plan to kind of work together and, and, and collaborate. And, and that's part of the reason I think both sets of the colleagues I work with are kind of pleased that I'm there as a bit of a bridging person. Um, but I've sort of discovered this week and the last couple of weeks that actually for my own sanity, I tend to compartmentalize these different jobs, even that, you know, there's, there's overlap, but it's two different sets of work. Yeah. And actually when I'm, when I then need to bring those two things together, as I had to in this meeting earlier this week, it, it suddenly becomes, you know, kind of fighting against myself. I'm saying yeah, keep, them, keep them separate <laughs> because otherwise it will become too kind of confusing and, and, uh, but, but yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm working, I'm working on that. Uh, but I think that's definitely true to say that climate commissions are independent kind of expert advisory groups mm. that are trying to influence primarily the local government. So that it's very much kind of top down, try, trying to influence the people in power, mm. whereas climate action leads is much more about community response that being said you know again we want to collaborate and bring in different organizations mm. um but it feels much more kind of grass like the grassroots is driving it the grassroots mm. got the two and a half million pounds funding from the national lottery mm. and yeah but i do i do kind of in, i like that I'm doing two things, but they have that quite, um, different approach to them, mm. uh, which hopefully, you know, it means they're complementing each other rather than yeah. trying to do exactly the same thing. It's the same end goal, uh, but different methods, which I think my, my ethos, and I think similar to others is we need to do everything and try everything. We can't just say, oh, don't worry, the climate commission's got it sorted because mm nobody's got it sorted and we we need to throw everything we can at, at this challenge yeah um just a quick question on for my own interest are you getting much uh input from unions have you got any sort of union membership in the commissions we do for yorkshire and humber climate commission um there's I was going to call him Bill Bailey, but it's not Bill Bailey. Bill Adams. Bill Adams, TUC, yeah. Um, from from the TUC for Yorkshire and Humber. Um, so so yes, and I can I can picture the sort of the list of organisations and sectors we wanted to be part of the commission, and mm. trade unions was on that list. Mm. And I'm I'm sure you're aware that you know, there's a lot of talk about a just transition mm -hmm. and I think, you know, the importance and the importance of having a voice for workers as we shift the way we do various aspects of work and various sectors. Uh, so, so that's very much kind of a, an important thing for, for Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. I'd say Leeds Climate Commission, which predates the Yorkshire one is, is, three to four years old now, the Leeds Climate Commission. So maybe, may, I don't think that has as much of a trade union voice in it, mm. um, but I think that maybe reflects how sort of the discourse has changed a bit over over the last few years that actually maybe in the climate space, workers are starting to mobilize and, and have more of a platform. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I'll add to that, that I'm part of, trade a trade union at the university as well and as i said try, trying to do do everything um 
I'm part of that trade union and, and within that, I'm kind of organizing around this same topic and, and thinking, yeah. of, you know, how do we, how do we lobby our university to, to do more and, and go faster? Mm. Uh, but also how do we ensure that the colleagues who are still working in the sort of oil and gas exploration yeah. end of, of the research sphere aren't just thrown out on their asses mm. without any kind of say or any kind of, you know, future opportunity or, or, or pathway to, to take those skills forward. Cause I, I think, yeah, it would go badly and it wouldn't help yeah. get us to where we need to be if, if we took that approach as well as being unfair. Yeah. Okay then. So, um, I want you to, to talk about your podcast a little bit or just to okay. mention it and, um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Anything else that you want to promote? Anything else that you want to sort of say or any questions that you have at the end? Cool. Yeah. So I, I'm also a podcaster. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess this, it kind of goes back to when I was studying at uni and I got involved with a student radio show, uh, kind of science, science radio show. Mm. Um, and I just sort of volunteered and thought, you know, I'll give it a go and see what it's like. And so I got this title of head of radio uh, with, <laughs> with, with no skills or knowledge, but enthusiasm did a few kind of training sessions in a radio studio, uh, and then, then had a weekly slot. And so I had to fill it with guests. And so I'd get kind of academics or just my mates on to, and, and I'd interview them about, about their research and stuff. So that was, that was my sort of taster into the world of sound and, and then interviews and recording. Um, and since, so, so I kind of, yeah, I kind of got that, got that, I guess, hun hunger for it a little bit and, mm. and enjoyment of it. Um, so since then I have been produce kind of producing sort of one-off infrequent episodes for a Australian and sort of Australia, New Zealand based climate show. Oh, yeah. uh, it's called climactic mm. and I started off as a listener and, but, but it's a very kind of collaborative show. So started off as a listener and then within a few episodes that the guy on the, the other end of the podcast is saying, you know, if you've got a climate story to tell, we want to hear it. Mm. Um, and they call themselves a collective climactic collective. So that, so the, the regular contributors, there's, there must be five or six different people that regularly produce shows for them. Uh, usually interviewing others that are working in, in some, some degree around climate change. Uh, so I, you know, I sent them a message and said, I'm in Leeds in England. There's lots of activism going on. Uh, you know, would you be interested in, in an episode for me? Mm. Um, and they, they said, yes. So I think I've done eight episodes for them over the last sort of three years or so. Um, and it's, I can't, yeah, it's kind of, it's been, it's been really funny. I, I kind of see myself then as like a sort of reporter journalist. Yeah. Uh, correspondent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm the UK correspondent for <laughs> sure. And, and what I found it with the last episode I produced was up in Glasgow at COP26. Oh, cool. And again, this kind of emblematic of, of my whole life at the moment that I was there, I decided I'm go, you know, I've got to be there as an yeah. activist. And then I thought, could I be there for work as well? Mm -hmm. Um, and I managed, so I managed to basically do both and be able to go up there and, and work there and represent both of the project, you know, both of my roles and both of my jobs. Uh, but I also got to go out on the streets and, and join the marches and the protests and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, so I, so I actually made again, perfect symbolism, made two podcasts, <laughs> one for work, yeah. um, with a, a colleague that I met up there interviewing delegates and, and getting different people's opinions on kind of the local to the global kind of, ha ha again, sort of the different levels of scale of, of action. Mm. Uh, but then, and, and on slightly different days, I produced a show 
uh, kind of under my own name for climactic about the climate activism and and really on the streets talking to the different people that were marching and mm. uh, kind of hearing the sounds of protest and and of desperation and and sometimes horror but also kind of joy that at least at least we're trying something at least we're surrounded by thousands of people that uh feel feel the same way i do yeah yeah i went to the um xr one the october one when was it 2018 um which was good you know when they they sort of closed most of london down yeah and uh yeah it was good it was a good good buzz being there and it was nice to be surrounded by people who wanted to actually do something yeah so totally good. yeah the the scary thing at the moment is the the sort of police crime and sentencing bill that people are protesting against now because it's got so many kind of super strict Mm. quite on and sometimes last really last minute changes to it that Mm. are going to mean that protesting on a road will be illegal and have a three-year jail sentence attached to it and it's like if we can't do that, like what, what can we do? Um, so yeah, so I think it's, as I say, my kind of recent work life has been totally kind of caused directly from being part of activism. Um, so it's kind of all in this big, messy, messy space in, in my head and life, but, um, but yeah, we will see, see where it takes me. Mm. So um, I'll just do a quick question on COP then. So, I mean, what was your, I mean, obviously I would encourage everyone and anyone listening to this to go and listen to the episodes that you've talked about, but I think, you know, it'd be good to have someone that was there on this. Um, So what was your takeaway from it? I mean, did you, are you just like, it was a lot of talk and nothing happened or were you like, there's lots of good stuff that happened, but needs more needs to happen or where do you sit? Yeah, I think there's there's no there's no black or white r- response. It 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 it's it's certainly not anywhere near what we need right now. And um, it could have been so much more, um, and needs to be so much more. But but equally, I see that you know it it is genuine progress, and we you know it's it's at least moving us. At least we're slowly moving in the right direction. It's it's nowhere near fast enough, mm. um, but there there are there are there are some reasons for optimism and hope. I think. I mean, without which, I think it's you know that you you certainly need that. And I think if if it had been a complete and utter failure, I think we would have seen uh, a lot more extreme kind of protest and extreme fallout from it. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think, you know, if you're an activist organization, you need to say it was a, f- <laughs> you, you say it was a failure and, and it, because you need to kind of keep up that pressure. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's a kind of negotiation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but as I say, I, I felt like a bit like the, the way I feel about the kind of jobs that I'm doing, I was like, I've got to go to it. Yeah. Given, given that it's, you know, relatively close to where I live, which is probably going to be the only time possibly in my lifetime, I need to go to it and I need to help add that pressure and try, try and do, do everything that we can. Mm. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so this is a question that I don't ask much anymore. Um, so it's future oriented. Um, but I'll ask it specifically of you. <laughs> where, so where do you see us in 2030? I mean, and like think of it from a work work point of view. So like in terms of the goals that you're setting for the climate plan and climate action, I mean, do you, is the hope that that just grows and grows and grows? Should it grow itself out of needing to exist or is it something that needs to get bigger and bigger and more people be involved or? So Climate Action Leads is five-year project. Um, and I think, I think we 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 know already we've got we've got two and a half million pounds from the national lottery. We've spread that quite thinly, mm-hmm. which is in, in some instances would not be the right thing to do. But I think the hope for us is spread it thinly and create 
a framework for how we're going how we could work mm. and then ramp it up with mm. with more funding from more sources mm. uh, and similarly it's a five year project where the aims are all around what the city's going to be like in the 2030s mm. zero, zero carbon nature friendly socially just leads by the 2030s so as of today we're set to fail because we haven't got enough funding to to achieve those goals mm. and as it stands we're going to stop working in 2025 so there's a, a time gap as well what i kind of would envisage is that so so a i hope we get to do what what we're planning to do and and ramp it up and scale it up make it bigger kind of thinking of like some sort of sticky substance that is kind of pulling people in and, and more and more people are sticking and realizing we need to be part of this. We need to join this team. But what I'm kind of imagining is that in 2030, we're actually shifting quite a lot away from making the kind of dramatic and transformative changes that we need that that's that's what we need to do between now and 2030 in 2030 and beyond the focus is much more going to be around kind of resilience and more like the kind of maintenance stuff to make sure that communities around Leeds are able to again su support the people you know make sure people aren't kind of subject to regular flooding or there aren't people that live in homes that that can't deal with heat waves and and that kind of thing so i think i think i think and hope the shift would be but by that time the shift would be okay we've done we've done the the kind of big stuff to lower our emissions and and start to live life in a different way but now we just need to focus more on kind of building up communities so that they can continue to uh, to, to thrive and flourish and, and, are uh, protected from some of the, the, the more extremes in terms of the, the weather that I think we're going to have by then. I mean, um, I'll ask this of you because you, you'll have a sense of it. Um, you know, you said that some of the commissions you, you're working with farmers and, um, what, what's their sense in terms of like crops and the future and being able to reproduce those crops and like, I, I mean, is there a, a lot of nervousness? Are they quite positive about it? Are they kind of, everything's fine or. I wouldn't say I'm, uh, enough of a sort of food expert to give a really good answer to this, but I think. I guess, I guess one, one example I would give is, is the fact that in, in Leeds, Leeds city council, for example, it's having a big focus around food and sustainable local food. Um, and I think part of what that tells you, it, it, there's a few reasons for doing that. One is because if we buy food from abroad, it will tend to have a higher carbon footprint because of, of the travel the cost of travel. Um, but the other, the other reason for doing that is that we've got more kind of control and it's kind of the reliability of food that is a stone's throw from Leeds compared to food that's halfway around being grown halfway around the world. Um, so I would have thought I'm kind of guessing here, but I would have thought that food production in the UK is, and, and in fact, I can think of research that I, uh, that, that colleagues have done at Leeds around food production in the UK. And I would say on the whole that yes, there are, there are kind of dangers to, to that from, from hotter temperatures. Um, uh, but those dangers are far greater in Asia and Africa and probably South America the dangers are far higher there that food production could be massively hit um than than we have a danger here so as i say growing food locally in the uk is not just good for the lower transport costs but it's also 
sensible in terms of, uh, you know, we're not as at risk uh, for things like drought mm. as, as other parts of the world. Mm. But equally, we, you know, an area could be massively flooded. That's a huge part of the food that we're relying on. And then it's like, well, then the resilience becomes where you getting those calories from now. Yeah. Really, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, it, and it's certainly, you know, food, food is certainly a major risk. Um, I, I guess it's UK food production is not high on my list of worries. Mm. Um, much higher on my list of worries is kind of the fact and, and the, yeah, is the fact that other parts of the world are going to become less and less hospitable to people. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, my, my worry is more around the kind of, uh, building of walls to, to protect, you know, to, to, mm. to stop climate refugees and that kind of thing that, that for me, that's a much bigger concern than, than our own local food production. But yeah, f I, but food production globally is, is definitely something that is concerning and a, a risk going forwards. But then that's a risk as well, isn't it? I mean, if you've got masses of like climate created refugees who have to wander around basically the countryside and find food. <laughs> Sooner or later, they're going to find some farms. Uh, yeah, it's all going to be crazy. Um, right, so I'm going to wind it up there because I want to let you go on time. Um, thank you very much for doing this. Um, thank you. Have we got your um, socials for following and so on? So I'm on Twitter at Simon underscore C underscore more. Uh, and you can find some of my... Uh, climactic episodes there uh, but the show is climactic.com.au i believe because it's australia uh so yeah no it's been it's been great to talk to you and yeah thanks for having me on yeah no great to talk to you and thanks for being on thank you again to simon for being my guest thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you for listening what do you do leads do you know what you're doing if you do then come and tell me about it if you're allowed to do that that is if you're not too scared if you and your business aren't ashamed of what you do, then let's hear about it. What good are you doing the rest of us? Please follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads to find out when episodes are being released. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Simon hyphen Treen, that's T R E E N. Or you can go to my company page, which is linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Western hyphen studios. If you want to make a podcast in Leeds, whether it's for a cause, a publicity campaign, a product promotion, or your own passion projects, then get in touch with Western Studios for support, advice, and guidance on anything podcasts. At Western Studios, you can work with a real lawyer who is actually in Leeds that you can actually work on with making podcast content. So don't wade through articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts. Western Studios can make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios can take on your podcast admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about it. Or, if you want to demand to see my company's peace policy, that's the place. Go to LinkedIn and engage with me there. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to go from there? Hit me up at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and let's start making your podcast right now. Save the hassle, save the headache, and make your podcast with a Leeds-based, in-real-life podcast producer, me, at Western Studios Leeds. Once again, please let Working Hours get big and strong by joining the Patreon and supporting the Working Hours project. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod right now and sign up. Why? Because we've got to find out what Leeds does, who Leeds is, and most importantly, who does Leeds really work for? and also to help me get 1,000 lawyers recorded talking about their work before 2030. Please remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to this show. Please rate and review Working Hours and do come back next week to listen to Debbie Rhodes, who is the director of Digital Covered. If you're listening to this, I assume you have some connection to Leeds, like living here or being from here. If you're such a person in Leeds or from Leeds and you haven't done a recording for Working Hours yet, then email me now and let's arrange some time to record your Working Hours episode. This is your show, Leeds. It's all about what you want to make of yourself. 
If you want to be on working hours, we will need a two hour window in which to record. I can record in your work time or during your downtime. I have been recording interviews over Zoom for over a year, but I can record offline too. You can appear on working hours anonymously or you can promote yourself and or your company or brand. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com if you want to be a guest. Add a short bio and some suggestions of your availability to your email or just send me your feedback, questions, comments and queries about working hours. I'm really interested to hear from anyone in Leeds or from Leeds in whatever industry, sector or role you are in. What is your experience? How do you feel about work? What do you like and not like? What do you do, Leeds? Please remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to this show. Please rate and review Working Hours and I'll see you next time, our kid. Working Hours is presented, edited and recorded by Simon Treen for Western Studios, Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org.